You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. I think it's going to be great. There's no better teacher for them on what NFL ball is going to be like than going against our three corners, our top three corners, Jair, Eric Stokes, and obviously Rasul. Um, so those guys will get a real quick initiation to the NFL. And I was joking with uh, uh, with a couple of my buddies um, on the squad and and, uh, and in the personnel department and, and training room, and I said, could be a long training camp for the offense. Uh, I like the way our defense is, is looking and playing, and and just on paper it, it looks like they're going to be pretty formidable. So it could be could be some growing pains for the offense, which would be great for us. It'd be nice to uh, to t- take our lumps uh, from time to time, and I think it'll help us, uh, you know, get better and and uh, and you know, facing a um, really good defense like that. That audio clip comes courtesy of the Pat McAfee Show and Aaron Rodgers, QB one, speaking uh, yesterday, actually talking about. Um, you know, coming into training camp and, and what he kind of expects. And I think it's so cool. He gave the plug there for uh, putting a little plug for the defense. Just talked about how, um, you know, he, he spoke to some of the front office and, and as well as teammates going, man, we're in for a long training camp because this defense, this defense is stacked. And there's somewhat of a young offense as far as the wide receiver core. And I think it's just a, it's just a great move, man. That's Aaron Rodgers 101. This guy's always thinking one or two steps ahead. Not only did he just build confidence in the defense, but what he also did was under Promised. And I feel like that's what he's done his entire career. He's under-promised and over-delivered every single time, right? I mean, you're talking about back-to-back MVPs, and the guy just looks like he's primed and ready for the NFL season. I'm really excited about training camp. And it's so cool when you talk about players going against good defenses. You know, uh, we talked about wide receivers having to go up against Jair Alexander and how that's a huge challenge. You're not going to get better training. You know, you had Jair Alexander when he stepped into the league was talking about how there was no better training for him as a young DB than to try to cover Devontae Adams one-on-one in training camp and in practice every day, right? I mean, it's something that goes hand in hand. And I was watching America's game the other day, the uh, Baltimore Ravens' first Super Bowl run uh, there, and, and Ray Lewis was talking about uh, when Trent Dilfer took over as their starting quarterback. And, and uh, Brian Billick, you know, the uh, the head coach, got a lot of criticism for that. They were saying Trent Dilfer, um, you know, it's still kind of the, uh, the the Mendoza line, if you will. It's it's that, that measuring stick when we talk about what level quarterback can win a Super Bowl if they have a great defense, right? But one thing that Ray Lewis pointed out was guys what people didn't take into consideration when it came to Trent Dilfer was real simple they didn't think you know for a second that this guy has been running the scout team this guy has been performing against the best defense arguably the best defense in the history of the league right but he's been having to practice against this defense all year long there was no quarterback that was that was more prepared than Trent Dilfer that year and and Ray Lewis pointed that out and it really you know, just it put a lot bulb off in my head. Like, wow, that's a great, great point. That's the same type of thing that Aaron Rodgers is talking about there. But welcome into Packer Total, Packers Total Access. I'm your host, Clayton Bailey. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. If you want to email the show, you got a question or a comment, you can do that by sending an email to Packers Total Access at gmail.com. We're actually going to answer a listener email today. And guys, we encourage that feedback. We love communicating with you guys in the email inbox there. It's just, it makes for such a better show. But what we have on tap today um, is is a great program for you guys. We actually have the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Matt Ramage. I know we've got a lot of Matt Ramage fans that listen to the show. I know Ryan turned me on to Matt Ramage a long time ago, just putting a small plug in for him. Not that Ramage needed him to, and not that Ryan needs Ramage. Not at all, right? These guys are, are, you know, 
just powerhouses when it comes to making Packer podcasts. But um, I listened to him one time, and I'm like, I love this dude's energy. Well, we've got the extreme pleasure of having him on the show today, and he's going to kind of cast a little vision like some of the other guests have of what he expects to see in the 2022 Green Bay Packers. I'm really excited about getting to chat with him for the first time. Hopefully, it's the first of many chats that he and I have on this podcast. Now, also, we're going to answer a listener email, like I said, talking about the run defense and kind of piggybacking off some of the topics that we've covered here lately. And uh, we'll get into that. Now, before we do so, we still have our Packers Rams Monday Night Football giveaway up, okay? Um, understand that the uh, the GoFundMe aspect has passed. Thank you so much to everyone who donated to the GoFundMe for Drew's Seizure Service Dog. You guys knocked it out of the freaking park, and uh, that obviously is going to give you guys an extreme advantage on winning this sweepstakes. However, if you still want to enter the sweepstakes, right, the uh, the raffle that we're going to be doing, it's for an indoor club seat for the Monday Night Football matchup against the Packers-Rams, um, you know, with the Packers and the Rams there at Lambeau Field. And, uh, guys, that's a, a ticket of $450 in value. And then also a VIP tailgate experience that's going to be right there next to Lambeau Field, indoors, out of the elements, all you can eat, all you can drink. That's $75 value there. You get both of those. Here's how you enter the contest. You go to my Twitter account, Packers at Packers underscore access. You click on the pin tweet at the top. Make sure you retweet that tweet and also follow the account, and that'll enter you into the contest one time. We're going to keep that up as of right now until August 5th. We want to give it away early in the season so it gives people time to prepare and be able to book flights if they need that or make sure that they set up their travel plans. Or I think it'd be really cool if somebody right there in Green Bay won the ticket as well. And uh, it's just going to be a chance for you to watch the ball game with us. It'll be me, Jacob, and my wife will be there. There's also some other people that are asking to get tickets, so we may have a, another portion of the crew that's going to be there with us, and we're just going to hang out and watch some ball and have a good time. So look forward to uh, meeting whoever wins that ticket there. Now, also, I want to talk about something real quick that Ryan mentioned on his podcast, and I think this is a great opportunity. You know, uh, he's going to he's gonna do something um, and kind of extend this, uh, this offer out to his listeners and his listeners only for the time being. If you need to get the word out and you're looking for some kind of advertising platform, as you guys have probably noticed, the network has grown tremendously. And you're, you're starting to hear a lot of ads on the programs. And, and I know that can be frustrating at times, but we thank you guys for sitting through that. It's something that's a necessary evil when you do podcasting and making sure that you've got the funds to keep the program up and running and, and doing it at an elite level or at least what we want to be an elite level we've never arrived but uh, I think we are getting better every day now with that being said what he's going to do for the listeners if you need to help get the word out with advertising reach out to Ryan reach you can reach out to me Um, you can email Ryan as well I'm sure he's got all that stuff attached to his Twitter account and if you listen to his show which I know if you're hearing my voice you definitely listen to his show um, he's going to be kind of plugging that a little bit more but really podcast advertising what it comes down to is really expensive trust me guys I, I own and operate five businesses they're five I have small businesses, but advertising is outrageously expensive. And this is something that the, the reason it's so expensive is because it's so effective, uh, you know, as, as far as a form of advertising. Now, what Ryan is going to do, he's just saying if you guys are looking for some kind of advertising, reach out to him and see if we can work something out uh, that works for you and your budget. And that's what we want to do. We want to kind of extend that out. So if we've got a small business owner that you guys can really benefit from having the advertising that most most of the time, you know, obviously Packer, most Packer fans are listening from the state of Wisconsin. There might be a local business there. There might be an internet, internet-based business that, that you could really benefit from in that regard. Um, just reach out to us and we'll see if we can work something out within your budget, you know. Um, it, it really, it's uh, it's all about helping the listeners out uh, first and foremost. We want to give back to you guys because you guys have done so much for us. So just keep that in mind. It's something that I think you could benefit from if indeed you find yourself in that situation and you're looking to do some kind of advertising. But with that said, let's go ahead and jump into our first segment here. Before we invite Matt Ramage on, I'm going to answer this listener's email. Okay, it says, hello, Brody here. First of all, love the show and the network. You guys do great work. Uh, I have a question if you happen to have time to address it. I've really enjoyed your game-by-game breakdown from last season. You mentioned previously that specifically the run defense struggled last season. I was hoping you could be more specific in describing who struggled and who did well. Thank you so much, Brody. All right, Brody, so here what we're going to do, um, as you guys know, I'm a big PFF fan. I'm not saying this to tell all end all, but it is the uh, the the grading system that I tend to trust the most. I really enjoy how it's put together. I think it's very easy to read, and I think they do a great job and very detailed. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to sort PFF by run defensive snaps. Okay, so you're going to start with the guy who had the most run defensive snaps. 
okay? And then we're going to work our way down. We're going to tell each grade and kind of see, okay, which players performed well, which players performed bad. And maybe it, there might be a couple surprises here or there where you realize, wow, that, that player didn't play a lot of defense, uh, rush defensive snaps, okay? So let's start right here at the top with 374 snaps. You've got safety Adrian Amos. So, um, again, 374 snaps. His rush defense grade was 77.2. I mean, that looks like, yeah, that's the second highest on the entire team. So, uh, Adrian Amos, again, you know, Ryan talked about it the other day on his podcast. Um, it makes us nervous, the fact that, you know, the, the contract's coming to an end. On top of that, there's a couple voidable years that are on the end of that contract, too. So, if in, if indeed they do decide to re-sign him and he's not willing to take a huge pay cut um, or a huge discount compared to his last contract which there's no reason he should I know he's approaching 30 if he's not 30 already but however we we do know that he is a very very valuable safety I think what will happen he'll probably get to test the market and then come back and the Packers can go okay you tack on those voidable years uh, salary cap hit uh, that plus what we would have to pay him to sign him in free agency as his best offer is it worth the for us to have him on the roster of course you could always franchise tag him but that's very very pricey and we know the Packers do not like to use a franchise tag unless indeed they're using it to bridge the gap in the trade like you've seen with Devontae Adams and kind of flex that franchise tag muscle but like Ryan said it's going to be hard to see him back next year seeing how you know how the the roster is structured is going to he might be one of those salary cap casualties in uh you know, in regard to how the Packers have kind of kicked the can down the road with, you know, people like Zadarius Smith. Obviously, they re-signed Preston Smith. You re-signed Devondre Campbell. You re-signed Rasul Douglas, which Rasul's contract is is somewhat easy to get out of. But at the same time, um, I think it's pretty reasonable to say that Adrian Amos, this might be his last year as a Packer. I hope that's not true. And the reason being is he was one of the the most solid defenders we had last year. He was, you know, even in coverage of 73.6, but again, had the most run defense snaps in the entire team and uh, graded out as a 77.2 second highest. So coming in next is Darnell Savage at 359 uh, run defensive snaps, okay? And his rush grade, here's a, a great contrast between the two. 50.7. Guys, that, that's really bad. That's a really bad run defense grade. And now you got to think he plays free safety, so his top priority is patrolling the middle of the field. And he's kind of uh, that guy who's going to be the, cover, the quote unquote coverage safety, right? Well, when you look at his coverage, you know, first of all, if you see a run defensive grade of 50.7, you're looking across the board going, okay, what did he do well? Well, his coverage grade was only a 62.2, so it really shows you how Darnell Savage had a bad year. You know, we can agree to disagree, those people that like to defend him, and I'm not, this isn't a personal attack on Darnell Savage. I hope he comes out this year and he's the top graded defender on the entire Packers roster. I really do. But, you know, you got to call a spade a spade, and the guy really struggled last year as a run defender at 50.7 with the second amount, second highest amount of run defensive snaps. So coming in third is Devondre Campbell with 353 uh, rush defensive snaps. And uh, he graded out with an 81.5. Guys, that is hands down the highest rush defense grade on the entire roster. He just absolutely balled out. And then you look at his coverage grade at 82.2. Like, he was just solid across the board. Devondre Campbell, I mean, the fact that they were able to lock him up and at the discounted rate, in my opinion, the discounted rate that they got him, uh, I love that signing. I think if he stays healthy, he's as he goes, this defense is going to go, and I think it's going to be huge for the Packers moving forward. Uh, coming in uh, next is Eric Stokes with 319 run defense snaps. And again, you know, when you play corner, you're, you're probably the, the least thing that you're worried about is how well is a corner playing the run, right? If the corner is having to make the tackle, then most most likely your run your run fit completely failed, okay, on the defensive side of the ball. So his came in at a 50.2. With that being said, um, a 50.2 run defense grade for a corner, guys, you still, this is grading what his responsibility was. And he did not do well at all in run defense. Now, his coverage grade with a 67.1. And as a rookie, staying healthy, primary, you know, for the most part, and playing the amount of snaps he did, I think he's got all the potential in the world to take another step this year and start to step into that go from a a solid corner to a good to great corner. And that's what I'm looking to see in Eric Stokes. But again, run defense grade, only a 50.2. Um, next, we had 291 snaps. This guy was not on the roster last year, so it, it kind of doesn't go with the question that Brody posed here. 
However, you know, seeing that they signed Jerron Reed in free agency, I think it's important to mention that his run grade, uh, run grade was only a 54.6. So, you know, these guys that they got really excited talking about how he was this highly touted prospect coming into the draft when he was, you know, coming into his rookie season. It's obvious that he's underperformed on every level. I mean, even his uh, his pass rush grade was only a 56 last year. That's not to say he can't can't fit into this scheme, and it's obvious that the front office had a high grade on him, just like most of the league did coming into the draft. Um, so let's hope that he turns that around. And it kind of makes me think, okay, what did they bring him in for? It's obviously it was just free agency debt or uh, uh, defensive line depth. And I kind of think the reason that they locked him up on the discounted rate that they did was because they didn't know if they were going to have to cut Dean Lowry loose. I really believe that played a role in that because, you know, when everything happened with with Devontae Adams, if indeed they did work something out with Devontae Adams, there was going to be major changes. You're probably not re-signing Devondre Campbell. You're probably not re-signing Russell Douglas. And you're probably having to cut a Dean Lowry loose. So maybe they went out and got Jerron Reed as kind of this insurance policy uh, in case they did have to get rid of Dean Lowry because his cap hit was so high this year. So the fact that you still got Dean Lowry on the roster, I kind of think that's how Jerron just stepped in. Again, if he's a solid backup, someone who could come in and play a backup role, I think it's a good signing for the price they got him at. But a 54.6, nothing to write home about as far as run defense. Uh, coming in next is Kenny Clark. This one was kind of surprising. Only 281 run defense snaps. And he's supposed to be our nose tackle. That that kind of really was like, wow, it opened my eyes. And this is why I like PFF and how organized their numbers are, is because it opened my eyes to say they really rotated a lot of defensive linemen um, into that, that run fit. And, uh, and what their role was as far as, uh, you know, playing run defense. Again, this isn't about, this isn't a grade that goes for him getting the tackle. This goes for how did he play the role that he was put into in the run defense. Only 281 snaps, and his run grade was a 56.7. Guys, that's, that is not good. And, and then you look at the pass rush get grade for, for uh, Kenny Clark, 77.8. And then we see the pictures that he looks extremely trimmed down right now. And it, was it just a good angle? We've all been guilty of taking that selfie at the right angle, right? You want to make sure you get rid of the double chin. You got the good side of the smile, all that stuff. Maybe that's what that picture was with Kenny Clark. Or maybe he did slim down and they said, you know what? Let's play to his strengths. It's obvious with a PFF grade of 56.7 run defense and a 77.8 pass rush grade maybe they're looking to slide him a little bit further outside i'm not talking about edge defender but get him out of that nose spot and maybe into a position where they can take advantage of a mismatch or two so again kenny clark only a 56.7 rush grade that's pretty bad up next is dean lowry 277 run defense snaps so you've got basically dean dean lowry and kenny clark had virtually the same amount of run defense snaps. Now, Dean Lowry was no better against a run than Kenny Clark, a 54.3, okay? Now, obviously, pass rush grade a little bit better, 73.9. Some would argue that that was Dean Lowry's best year of his career so far. Um, I, I would say that's a, a pretty fair assessment of how he played. But at the same time, when you see a trend like this with the defensive lineman struggling so much against a run, it kind of takes me back to the comment I made on the last show where I heard on the PFF podcast with Chris Collinsworth, where the guys were talking about what defenses are starting to adjust to is what they're finding is a big, uh, a big uh, offensive play through the passing game is kind of resulting in a, a half of a point on the scoreboard. And they have the, the analytics broken down way more than I think is necessary. But what they were trying to prove is that it's showing that teams are starting to realize we've got to stop the pass and force these teams to run the ball. And you kind of seen that happen with Kansas City. You know, Kansas City in that game that they lost there at the end, their running game looked really, really good. But they always came away from it. And you've seen a lot of defenses play that too high shell. They were playing that two man under look, right? And and the only way to be a two man to, to beat a two man under look and to force a defense out of that, you know, Aaron Rodgers hates the two man look. He hates having two safeties up top and man coverage across the board. And that's why he leaned on Tay so much in certain situations. And it's really what slowed that offense down after they went on that scorching run there, you know, in the uh, you know, after the Super Bowl bowl run was because they were starting to realize defenses realized and and that 34 zone blitz scheme kind of took off and 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 ran rampant through the entire league 
Aaron Rodgers on third down blitzes was cutting defenses apart. And they wisened up and said, let's play a little two-man shell and make him, force him into the run. And what they did with Kansas City last year in that playoff game is they forced, they, they tried to make them run the ball. And they knew that Kansas City would be too impatient to do it. So they continued to pass, and lo and behold, it cost them that, uh, that playoff uh, win there. So I think it's just important to kind of understand what PFF was pointing out, that uh, not that all their analytics are 100% correct, but it's just kind of showing – defenses across the league are starting to go, you know what, we're going to give you the run and we're going to take the pass away from you. We're going to take those big plays away from you and try to make you use every inch of the field and go down the field. And a lot of schemes just aren't designed to do that. So Dean Lowry, a 54.3. Um, like I said, the number that sticks out, though, uh, pretty much a, a virtually an equal amount of run defensive snaps than Kenny Clark. Um, coming up next, and keep in mind too, guys, they're in the nickel the majority of the time. Typically, that's a two-four-five or a three-three-five. So these guys are on the field of, of uh, you know a pretty uh, pretty comparable amount of time. That plays into those numbers as well. So uh, Russell Douglas comes in next with 244 snaps. Now, obviously, being the opposite corner to Eric Stokes, run grade of only 56.8, run defense grade, I should say. But obviously, his coverage grade 77.2. So you see the two corners there. I'm not concerned about those two rush defense grades because, again, if the corners are making the tackles, something went horribly wrong in the run fit. But at the same time, they're being graded on their responsibility. Got to get that grade up. Um, I want to see this defense improve rush defense unless Joe Barry is coming to the table and saying, forget the rush, let's focus on the pass, let's make that top priority. And it kind of looks like the numbers suggest that's what they were doing. Uh, up next is Chris Barnes, 236 run defense snaps. I am the poster child for being a Chris Barnes fan. Three years ago or two years ago, I was the guy on Facebook before I was a part of this podcast. I literally posted on, on you know, Ryan had put a question up on his Facebook group, and he had said, um, who is the most underrated player? And I said, Chris Barnes. And he really scoffed at it. And I'm safe to say or proud to say now, I've been humbled. He was right. 48.7 was Chris Barnes' run defense grade, guys. 48.7. That is horrible and again 236 snaps he had plenty of opportunities to stop the run and he did not know how to play in that run fit especially when you know kind of like when you compare Kenny Clark to Dean Lowry those numbers are very similar it kind of looks like what we just talked about and what the priority of the defense was well Chris Barnes lined up in that same nickel defense alongside Devondre Campbell his is a 48.7 Devondre Campbell's is an 81.5 that really tells the story right there. And now we know why Quay Walker was that first round pick, right? Let's say Quay Walker comes in and he performs, you know, in the 60s. Guys, that's a ginormous improvement over a 48.7 as far as responsibility, making a minute amount of mistakes in the rum fit. That could play a huge role. Coming in next is our very own Rashawn Gary. Arguably the player that, that Packer fans are, are most excited about. He had 232 run defense snaps. He graded out as a 70.1. That is a solid run defensive grade, especially for an edge defender. I've seen it time and time again. In the offseason, when I was watching uh, the tape and I was trying to really focus on Rashawn Gary and see what he did well, because like Ryan pointed out on his podcast, he has a very small amount of uh, of sacks for as many pressures as he's gotten, right? It's just something that's kind of alarming. But what I did notice in the process, although his pass rush grade was a 90.1, which is elite, we're not going to – listen, we'll take that all day and twice on Sunday, right? But his run defensive grade being a 70.1, that really showed up on tape to me. The way he would contain, the way he would go out of his pass rush and into the backside pursuit of a running play – And the hustle that Bain Bain shows all the time, I mean, I think that's a solid grade there. Right beside him, Preston Smith, 74.6. He had 230. They had basically the same amount of run defensive snaps, and he came in with a 74.6. I'm glad Preston Smith got an extra bag because that dude deserves it. I think he's done done everything he should do. As a Packer, I hope that he uh, he performs you know the same the, the same level he did last year. He came in last year at eighty one point five. You know the thing that Preston Smith sometimes does too. He's asked to cover a little bit. You'll see some of these little fire zone blitzes that might, they might mix in, and he does a decent job in coverage to be such a big edge rusher. But seventy four point six in a running game that's pretty solid. And then coming in next is Jonathan Garvin, one hundred and forty four snaps, fifty three point one. That's an abysmal grade. 
This is the one that hurts, guys. This is exactly what Ryan talks about coming up next here. 122 snaps is TJ Slayton. And we all get excited about TJ Slayton and how he's we felt like he really performed well and this and that. You know, with his size and him being a traditional nose tackle, his his focus, his his strength should be defending the run. Guys, his run defensive grade was a 44.7. Now, what did the Packers do this year? They went out and got Devontae Wyatt. I, I swear the writing's on the wall. This proves more now than ever. I'm not saying that Brian Gutekinds is in his office combing through PFF stats, but this shows me that PFF is on the right track. Two of the biggest eyesores in run defense for the Packers was TJ Slayton uh, at defensive line and uh, linebacker, inside linebacker Chris Barnes, and that was their two first-round picks. You replace those two guys okay, or even Dean Lowry with Devontae White in time. I know he's a rookie. It's going to take some time. And you replace Chris Barnes with Quay Walker. I'm telling you, this defense has already improved tremendously. So I hope that answered your question there, Brody. Um, I, I'm not going to go through the entire defense because the snaps get really low. Like I said, we get under 100, and it's kind of pointless to even look at that. But I think that was a really cool exercise, and I appreciate the question. Thank you for emailing the show. And we're going to move on now. We're going to bring in Mr. Matt Ramage and see what he thinks about the 2022 Green Bay Packers. But before we do that, guys, let's pay some bills and take a quick commercial break. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom-heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. All right. Now, joining us on the line, man, this is an absolute pleasure to have one of my favorite podcasters on the show, uh, Mr. Matt Ramage. If you guys don't know Matt, you've been living under a rock. He does the the best content as far as, uh, you know, Packer fans are concerned, in my opinion. This dude is awesome. Uh, not only is he uh, is he the guy that umpired a Packer celebrity softball tournament or a game, I should say, but he actually had the testicular fortitude to solicit social media follows from the players while he's up in the game. Is that a true story, Matt? Um, I, no, I, I'm not sure. I, I asked him to follow me, but like a few like knew me there that, that I was like surprised. Like uh, <laughs> Kaiser knew who I was and he's like, Hey, I love your content. And, oh yeah. So th- that's what I was. Cause I was like, then why don't you follow me, dude? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I actually said that to him. I think I was like in my head. But I was like really shocked that amount of uh, players, because a, a few players, you know, some players follow me, but like I was surprised at how many like like knew my name. No, it, dude, you're a legend. I'm just telling you right now. You can play humble all you want. You had Preston Smith on your show, which you absolutely crushed that interview, man. You've got a certain energy that you bring to the table, along with a humbleness, and you don't take yourself too serious, which that drives me insane with some podcasters. It just turns me off quicker than anything. You're the real deal, dude. And, and like I said, we appreciate you coming on the show. But here's why I've got you here, first of all. And if, for you listeners, if your lights flicker a little bit, it's because this guy brings so much energy. He's probably pulling some power right out of your circuits right there in the house. But I wanted to ask you on 
what what was your take on the uh, on the 2022 Green Bay Packers this year coming up? I had a couple questions. I want to kind of see well, how does Matt Ramage feel about this team going into the season? And the first question I got is, barring any crazy injuries, right? You know, anything, you know, Aaron Rodgers goes down, something like that. Um, what would you think would be a realistic record for the Green Bay Packers here in the 2022 season coming up? I think right around the 12 to 14 wins. Like, it it really depends, but uh, I think that 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 they're going to win thirteen games again. Um, yeah. This defense is is going to be really, really really good. I think the special teams will be improved. Like the offense, I think Aaron Rodgers is going to figure it out, and, and the running game is ridiculous. Matt Lafleur is a smart, creative guy. He's not. They're not just be like, oh, we lost a receiver, now we're screwed. Like they're gonna they're gonna figure it out. And I, I, I and th- this defense, barring injury, is like it, it could be one of the best defenses. In, in in the whole league. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And, and you know, it's it's funny last year, I think as Packer fans, we got so used to outside of the 20, the 2010 season, we got so used to there just being these bad defenses, right? And then we had a defense that kind of finished there in the middle of the pack, maybe upper tier. And we were like, oh my God, the sky's the limit with a defense like this, right? So I'm with you. I think they're going to take a huge step forward this year too. And, and you know, Aaron Rodgers kind of talked about it yesterday on the Pat McAfee show saying, man, this is going to be something that, uh, you know, as we, uh, as we step into training camp, the offense is going to struggle, man. You, you look across the, the line and you see a Jair Alexander, a Eric Stokes, and a, and a Rasul Douglas, along with Adrian Amos floating around. This is going to be a great test for these young receivers for sure. But, man, you're, you're right there in that ballpark with everybody else. I'm trying not to persuade anyone of saying how many, you know, I think they'll do this many wins. Do you agree with me? I just want to test the waters from all the podcasters, and everybody is coming up with anywhere from 12 to 13 wins. You saying 12 to 14, that's kind of what I said. There's absolutely no chance if Aaron Rodgers stays healthy that we don't we don't win less than 11 games in my opinion but I could see 14 man if this team gets hot and it's it's exciting so with that being said Matt let me ask you this who do you think is going to be a breakout player this year you know obviously Rashawn Gary has kind of been kind of been the darling the last couple of years it seems like people have come around on him quite a bit excluding Gary is there a player that sticks out to you? It can be on offense or defense that you could say, man, I really could see this player, this young player breaking out this season. Is there anybody who comes to mind? Well, like you, you could look at like Rasul Douglas, but I think some people might say he broke out last year, but I think that he might prove that he can be a consistent player. He, he can, he can do it at, at a high level. And he, with Jair being back, he won't be as far up the depth chart, but um, I think some of these rookies, like especially at, on the defensive side, I, I think that they could, but I think it's going to have to be a wide receiver, whether that's a tight end, if it's Tanya that has a, I mean, he kind of broke out a couple of years ago before he got hurt, but I, I think someone on the offensive side of the ball is going to have to step up uh, more, more than others. Will it be Alan Lazard? Will it be one of the rookie wide receivers? Um, I, I think uh, Amari Rogers, I think it is someone that could really, ball out this year he got a lot of criticism last year his rookie year now he's got a whole offseason under his belt going into training camp I, I could see him j- just uh lighting up so if I had to say one player I'd I'd, I'd think uh I'd go with Amari Rogers oh I like it man I'm telling you it, it, it's what's crazy is everybody remembers the special team gap right and they don't they don't think about the fact that he had such a minimal amount of snaps on offense. I, I, I think the number was somewhere around 11 or something crazy. Maybe it was 11 targets. I can't remember. It was just an extremely low number. And everything that I seen on tape, though, I'm like, wow, this, this guy, he looks like he could play at the NFL level. It's just such a small sample size. If he comes out, and he can become a Randall Cobb 2.0. And, and even I think it was Jason Vrabel that said it, you know, the wide receivers coach said earlier this offseason, he said, you know, the guy came in, came in now, and, and it's not just him competing for the slot position. I've got him, I've got him trying X, I've got him trying Z. Um, he's just a player that's hungry to get on the field. So if he could come out, man, and perform at a at a solid level, I think this offense is really gonna go because he's such a dynamic player. You know, he was in college with the jet sweeps and things like that. He just fits the role as a receiver in this offense. I would love to see him take a step forward. You're right, man. If we get any of the young receivers to step up along with this defense coming out and playing solid, I think the sky's the limit. Um, So last question for you, Matt. 
Um, here's the big one. This is the one that everybody's thinking about. You know, Rogers got the, the contract extension, right? The, the three-year extension, making it a five-year total deal. And, and when you look at it and you hear Rogers and other people talk about it, it's still this big mystery. No one completely understands how the contract is structured, which is amazing to me with all the, all of the things that we have at our disposal, you know, as far as the internet goes, no one can still understand the contract completely. But Rogers saying it's a one with a two and the option of a three kind of makes you think it's one to three years is that window. If you had to give an answer today on uh, how long do you think Rogers will play, what do you think that would be, man? Because, you know, I've, I've kind of went back and forth. I'm like, I don't know, man. Maybe he wants to be like Brady and play till he's 110, you know, uh, or <laughs> is it going to be something where, you know, he, he this is his last year. It's just kind of a crapshoot. But what do you think, man? How many years do you think Rogers will play? My my guess is two years, but I could really see it if if the Packers did did win the Super Bowl this year, I think that that he'd retire. I, I don't think that Rodgers is like Brady. Like I know that Rodgers said way back when I want to play into my forties, but I I think that he might have changed his mind. Like obviously I have no inside information. <laughs> like I, I don't I don't <laughs> talk to him, but it seems like after last off season, like he was content. Like he said it, I was content with just walking away, retiring. I think he cares more. I don't think he wants to play for another team. I think everyone talks about that. They've been talking about that the last few years about always oh, going to go to the Broncos and do this and that before they got this contract figured out. But I, I, I think that he likes playing in Green Bay. He's seen what happened to Favre and he cares about his legacy. He's talked about legacy like multiple times. I think he, I think he cares about what it means of what he's done in Green Bay. But um, I, I think it, if, if they won it all this year, I could see him walk away. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe they won it all. They get greedy, and he says, "All right, we can do it again." Uh, but yeah, I, 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 I'm thinking like one or two years, and then, then he'll be gone. Yeah, that's really cool because when I asked Ryan Slip this question, you know, uh, from Packernet Podcast, I asked him. I said, "You know, how long do you think he play?" And he, he said the same exact thing, if I remember correctly, Matt. He said, "If he, if they win a Super Bowl this year, I could see him walking away." And you know, it, it sucks to see the end of an era approach like this. But man, if we could send him off that way. That would be awesome. Oh, that would be beautiful. God, it, it would be like best case scenario, right? And and you know, kind of going back to the off-season drama the last few years, the thing that that really stood out to me, you know, as an emotional Packer fan, when he first started rocking the boat with the front office a little bit, I kind of got mad at first. But then when I heard his side of the story, I'm like, you know what? I can kind of see where he's coming from. He's got a lot of years invested into this, and he wants he wants to make sure these silos are torn down moving forward. If indeed he does care about the organization, and he's proven to me he does, and and I think that that's what he kind of you know once we got beyond that point where he's like, look, this is I, I want to retire a Packer, but these things are bothering me. Let's put it all on the table, man. Kudos to him. Kudos to Brian Gutekunst. Kudos to Mark Murphy for making everything. Uh, happened the way it did, and, and it seems like everything, you know, all is well in Packer land for sure, man. I'm excited for the uh, for the season, man. It's going to be a great year, and uh, yeah. So thank you so much, Matt, for for joining us, dude. I, I can't tell you uh, how much it means to me because. I listen to Ryan's podcast a lot and I'm kind of like the, you know, he, he calls himself the resident fanalist. I'm even more of that. You know, I'm, I'm a fan that listened to the podcast, put in an audition tape and he said, you know what, come on and let's do some shows, see if this works out. So that's how I got here. But he, oh, okay. yeah, he said one day he was like, you know, um, you know, I heard him on the podcast. He was like, I, I really like Matt Ramage. I like his style, I like his approach, his delivery, all that stuff. And he's the reason that I found your podcast and your show and your YouTube network and all that stuff. I mean, it's something that it, uh, it, it kind of stuck with me from the beginning. Obviously you got Matt Ramage, Matt Ramage show.com. Right. And, yeah. and, uh, and you're like the, the quick trip phenom, bro. I love it. I love all <laughs> the, and I've been to green Bay several times. And anytime I'm, I'm in the state of Wisconsin, I start looking for quick trips and it's mainly because of people like you who promote it so much, I man, it's just a really cool stop, but yeah. So he's, he's the reason I found your show. And I just want you to say, man, don't ever change. I, I Don't ever change what you do. You bring such a, a humble approach, yet a fun approach, all the energy, all that stuff. You absolutely crushed it on that. What was the podcast you were on here recently, or you were on with some other co-hosts? Was it yesterday you did a show with uh, Last Call Lambo? Am I thinking right? Yeah, I, I, did, I did. On my podcast, I did uh, with Last Call Lambo. They came on. And like uh, a couple weeks ago, I, I was on theirs. That Last night was a wild one. We were drinking. <laughs> I, I, that, it was like a two-hour podcast. I've never recorded a two-hour podcast. 
Uh, I don't expect people to listen to the end. Even like after the first hour or so, we were like, no one's listening anymore. We can just say whatever we want. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude. <laughs> That's way too long. I made it all the way to the end because there, there's just something about this messed up world we live in right now. When you get a podcast where there's multiple people laughing, it's infectious. It really is, man. And, it, and it's everything the world needs today. And it's exactly what you bring to the table, dude. So thank you so much for being you. And thank you for taking the time to come on with me, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, I really appreciate you having me. And, and uh, Ryan is a man. I, I think he's probably the best Packers podcaster. Like he's so consistent. He like sh he just shoots all podcasts every day. That, that that dude's a wizard. Yeah, man. He 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 definitely kept me engaged. Like I told him the other day, you know, through some dark times. And it was just you. It was like clockwork. You you would log on, and there was always a podcast. And he was always bringing some kind of quality content. And I, I know exactly where you're coming from there, man. But you're right there, dude. I'm telling you right now. He would say you're probably the best podcaster because he's got that mutual respect. Like I said, he's he's the reason I, I found your podcast, and I'll be a loyal listener to the end, dude. So uh, thank you so much, man. We really appreciate it. Hey, right, right back at you. Once again, thanks so much to Matt Ramage for taking the time to come hang out with us, man. I love that guy. Make sure you go check him out on Twitter, at Matt Ramage. I'm sure you're already following, but if you're not, uh, make sure you check it out. He's he's just an awesome dude, man. So Such a ball of energy, always positive, always making you laugh. It's just, just really, really cool. So um, I do want to cover a tweet real quick, actually a message I received in the – and the DMs here on Twitter. It comes from at Mac Berge. He's a loyal listener. Appreciate your support, man. He just shared a tweet with me from uh, from a, a Twitter account. I think it was Zach Cruz, I believe was his name. Um, he says, it says, Aaron Rodgers on rookie wide receiver Samori Torre per the Pat McAfee show, quote, the seventh round pick has got a lot of stuff to him. And, you know, Aaron Rodgers doesn't throw that stuff around lightly. In the past, it's obvious the people that he spoke about, he thought very highly of. Now, listen, he was there just a few days. And first of all, thank you so much for the uh, the DM, Mac. I appreciate it. Um, he was just there for a few days in OTAs, right? And it's funny, the media didn't hardly report on that, right? Because they said he wasn't going to be there, but that's neither here nor right? yeah, You know me, I wouldn't take a shot at the media, but um, regardless. So, he was just there a few days. What could he have possibly seen to really say, oh, yeah, wow. You know, obviously he didn't come out and say this guy's going to be a stud or anything like that. But I think that we all, you know, when we heard Samori Torre's name, uh, you know, called for the Packers draft, um, I didn't go, yes, they got Samori Torre. I went, who is this cat? Let's go research him a little bit. And when I got to digging into it, this guy has had a lot of success. And he does have a lot of tools in the back at the college level. Let's see if it translates to the NFL. But that's awesome. I appreciate that, Zach. Or, uh, Mac, I, I didn't catch that when I listened to the interview. And it's pretty cool that he, there's already singing some praise for the uh, the rookie wide receiver. Let's hope he's right. Let's hope we got another Donald Driver on our hands, right? I mean, Donald Driver, one of the most underappreciated, uh, not just Packer wide receivers in the history of the game, but the entire NFL, what that guy was able to do with his back against the wall and, and looking at possibly being cut and become the all-time, uh, what is he, all-time uh, receptions leader, I believe, in Green Bay history, if I remember correctly. Just an absolute stud. I don't know if he's Hall of Fame material or not, Donald Driver, but, man, if, if for some reason he, there's just such a, you know, they talked about this on Matt Ramage's podcast last night with the Last Call Lambo uh, crew. They were just talking about how they, it's such a backlog when it comes to wide receivers trying to get into the Hall of Fame. And you've seen how T.O. had to wait, which, let's face it, that was more the media slapping him across the face a couple of times and going, we don't rem we, we don't forget you know, how you acted when you were in the league and how you acted towards the media. I think that was wrong of the Hall of Fame committee, but it is what it is. You know, you don't bite the hand that feeds you, I guess you could say, if, if the Hall of Fame means that much to someone. But it's going to be very hard for Donald Driver to make a case for the Hall of Fame. But, man... The appreciation I have for that guy and what he did for the organization is just—he was just such a such a Packer player through and through, and continues to kind of to kind of carry on that tradition, uh, being the just the type of person he is and 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 that type of thing. So I want to move on to a little bit of news. We're going to wrap the show up here a little early. Uh, Ian Rappaport reported uh, yesterday, from the best of my knowledge, he was the first one to report on it. Um, his original tweet said, "There's a new quarterback in Carolina." The, the Panthers are acquiring former number one overall pick Baker Mayfield from the Browns for a 2024 conditional fifth round draft pick. Sources tell me and Tom Pelissero, Dill is pending a physical. All parties split the financials to make it happen. Okay, there, we need more details on what that exactly means. All parties split the financials to make it happen. It kind of makes me think that Carolina 
basically, uh, you know, it's, it's a conditional fifth round pick. So obviously it wasn't about draft compensation, but it was about Cleveland trying to recoup some of that salary cap hit that they were going to have to eat with Baker Mayfield, you know, with that being uh, that rookie contract being guaranteed. What's probably happened is Carolina Panthers have agreed to pay for half of that salary cap hit. So uh, now I wanted to touch on this briefly because Baker Mayfield, in my opinion, is very, very underrated. And I'm going to explain why. Um, you know, excuses are like rear ends. Everybody's got one and they all stink, right? Everybody plays hurt in the NFL at some point, okay? Um, when it comes to Baker last year, he was hurt. It was his non-throwing shoulder, but you could see the harness he had to wear, and you could see it all year long. Something was off, and, and, and it made me think, am I just being biased because I like Baker Mayfield? Now, I want to set aside the personal issues for a second because it did seem to me by the end of the year no one came out and defended Baker Mayfield. Not one single person on that ride. It sounds like draft day, right? Nobody attended his, his 21st birthday party. That's why he dropped in the draft. Nobody really came to his defense that I'm aware of on the Cleveland roster and said, no, Baker's misunderstood. Baker's a leader. Baker's our guy. Nobody defended him. That really speaks volumes. But if you go strictly with what he's done on the field, and let's say he just had a bad year of personal issues, and he's going to turn that around. Well, if you look at his 2018 uh, grade when it comes to PFF, okay, the guy, I mean, he passed for 3,700 yards. So let's look at attempts. I should do it that way. He had 486 attempts passing the football, okay? His PFF grade on offense was an 83.2. Guys, as a rookie... 83.2 at the quarterback position is unheard of. That is like, oh my God, this guy's going to be a superstar. And for anyone who's shaking your head going, no, I don't mean, if Jordan Love had come out and played a significant amount of snaps because let's say Aaron got hurt and he graded out to be an 83.2, you know darn well Packer fans would be screaming, we've got us another Hall of Fame quarterback. I mean, that's, that's a solid grade. Okay, what did he do his sophomore season? Everybody faces a sophomore slump, right? He only drifted back to a 74.8. Now, at this point, you got to go, okay, he's now the starting quarterback. If he regresses into the 60s, then that rookie year begins to look like an anomaly, right? Well, you go into 2020, he jumps back up to an 81.6 PFF grade. This guy was on track to be a Pro Bowl caliber quarterback. I mean, that's what the grades are suggesting. Now, whether popularity prevents him from getting voted in, that's a whole different ball game. But when you just strictly look at what he did on the field, how he graded out, according to PFF, that is a solid, that is a top 10, maybe even a top 5 quarterback in the league. So now you go to 2021. He drops all the way down to a 63.6. And the reason I mention that is because he was injured. There's one of these. It's like the thing they used to make you do in school, right? Which one of these four don't belong, right? I mean, that 63.6 is a far cry from two years where he graded over 80 and his worst year before that only being a 74.8. If it had been 83.2, 81.6, 74.8, then 63.6, that would tell me the league's caught on to him and he's not as good as a rookie year suggested. But the fact that he went 83.2, 74.8, bounced back to an 81.6, and then dropped down to a 63.6. To me, it's pretty obvious that that 63.6 was strictly because he was hurt. I have no reason to think that he would not have performed in the 70s at least last season. And also keep in mind that he's had different offensive coordinators virtually every single year. He's had different head coaches, right? So he's going to go to Carolina if that left shoulder is indeed healthy, and it should be going into the season, mark my words, with Christian McCaffrey in the backfield, with more split out wide, with Matt Rule doing what he's done in college, I'm not saying Matt Rule is an elite coach, but he knows what he's doing. I'm telling you right now, I think Carolina comes out as the darlings here. And the reason being is if you look at Cleveland, I know this is a Packers podcast, but these are the things that are going on around the league right now. And guys, we're going to have a quarterback issue in anywhere from one to three years. Everybody that I've interviewed the last several podcasts, they've all agreed they don't see Rodgers playing beyond three years, and this might be his last year. It's really important that we keep our thumb on the pulse of, okay, what's going on around the league at the quarterback position? But if Carolina comes out and they end up having a top 10 quarterback in Baker Mayfield moving forward, 
that franchise really just flipped the script on their future. And then look at Cleveland. Cleveland upset Baker by going out and trying to persuade Deshaun Watson in coming in. And lo and behold, it worked, right? Now they've got Deshaun Watson. But now they're going to be facing what I think is going to be a minimum of a year-long suspension. It could be six to eight games, but I think it's going to be a minimum of a year-long suspension. And on top of that, guys, these civil cases are not going away anytime soon. Those are going to drag out for at least two years per Andrew Brandt in the Business of Sports podcast. Okay, Cleveland has done the most Cleveland thing they have ever done in the history of their franchise. Before, of course, moving to Baltimore and losing the front and all that, you know, let's don't even go down that rabbit hole. But I'm telling you right now, Cleveland made a mistake. I think Baker Mayfield's going to come out. He's going to ball out. He might not be in the 80s this year, but I think he bounces back into the 70s. And in the next year or two, he's back in the 80s. And the Carolina Panthers, you're going to see them turn around. I think it's a matter of two to three years. The Carolina Panthers are going to really, really compete in the NFC. Mark my words. So I thought it'd be important to uh, to mention that. And there's a hot take to go for Ryan right there, right? It's outside of the Packers, <laughs> outside of the Packers talk, but at the same time, it's a hot take. I think Baker's going to going to return to old form that he did there in his first three years, and Carolina's going to turn it around. But it's important, like I said, to cover the news in that regard. And that's one of the reasons why we have an afternoon show. We want to hit on some of these things and, and kind of let Ryan continue to do what he's done great for so long in his style of podcast. And we want to bring some little news and like this to the table. So with that being said, we're going to wrap up the show there. Again, want to send a special thank you to Matt Ramage uh, for everything he did um, to come, you know, cut cut time out of his, his busy day to come on here and hang out with us. And I know it's going to bring a ton of quality uh, to the show. And it's always nice to get a Wisconsin accent in here um, as opposed to this redneck accent. I know you guys get tired of it. So um, again, thank you to Matt Ramage. Thank you to everybody who donated to GoFundMe. That's officially closed there. We got Drew to his goal. Congratulations, Drew. You deserve it, buddy. We're glad we could help. And we're going to move on to the next thing as far as uh, as helping someone else out. We'll, we'll come up with another giveaway way later and handle that but again the giveaway is still active go to my twitter account look at the pinned tweet all the instructions are there i'm not going to bore you with the details here and also guys if you're looking to do some advertising like we said on the front side get with ryan schlipp immediately because i'm telling you i from a business owner right here i'm telling you it's going to be a heck of a deal for the advertising because podcasting advertising is extremely expensive and here you know we're kind of in the in the off season but still running great numbers with these podcasts and uh, you know packer net podcast family it's an opportunity to maximize a, a good deal there so get up with ryan on that so we're going to wrap the show up there thank you guys so much for your time thank you for hanging out with us you can be listening to anything you're choosing to hang out with our wacky butts and, and we don't take it lightly as always guys let's go out and be the change that we want to see in the world and go pack go Thursday. Here's the go.